with Gareth Bill. It was literally like 3 a.m. and I checked, I was ranking top for like SEO Essex. And I was like, what the hell? But I would also say like positioning the agency is crucial. Yeah. Like we're not trying to do everything. We don't do a lot of strategy, it's more just productization. I hate to be stagnant myself, so if your staff are stagnant, they're gonna probably leave as well. And one of the answers that I always give is that Hey, very quickly, if you are struggling ranking your website on Google, maybe you are an e-commerce store trying to get more sales or potentially you might even be a local business trying to generate more leads for your company, check the link down below. I have helped businesses rank higher than the Google logo. Okay, that might have been a slight lie, but if you are looking to consistently grow your revenue month on month, check the link down below, fill in the form, see if my team can help you. Right, back to the video. So today I am joined with Gareth Bill. Hello, how are you? Doing well, thanks for, thanks for joining me. No problem. So um, for anybody that doesn't know who you are, who are you, what'd you do? That's a good question. Um, so I've been doing SEO for I think 13 years back in the day, sort of like early social media-y SEO kind of days. Um, and then I was working for um, a clothing company and I was sort of had a side project for them and I was driving leads to them. Mm -hmm. And I was earning commission from that project and it was just like a, a local embroidery website and it started to get leads. And I started to funnel those leads into the business that I was working for. And um, the owner was like, oh, like, what's, how's this working? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I just sort of set an exact match domain up mm -hmm. and it just started ranking. And I was buying links off Fiverr. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is like early, early SEO days in my mind. Um, and it was working. I didn't really know why it was working. So I was driving leads, driving revenue. Um, and I was like, okay, I sort of understand it to an extent now. And then... I sort of left that business um, and launched the agency. And I was started actually, Bulldog Social Media was the original name. And then I pivoted into SEO because social media management sucks, basically. <laughs> right, okay. So what, um, in, in the 13 years, like obviously you've, yeah, you've I'm, I'm hoping you're going to say you know how to do SEO now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <definitely>. <laughs> What's um, like, how, how did you stumble on that? Because that, it's, it's quite niche, okay. like... What in terms of like what um what what made you say like right okay I'm gonna set up this website like yeah so I've always been quite entrepreneurial I guess right. I've always been like without sounding weird but like wheeling and dealing I guess I've always been like trying to come up with ideas because my brother is he's like four years younger than me and he's he was early internet days where he'd have his own kind of software products online mm -hmm. and he'd run into my room and go, bro, like, look how much money I've made. And he was like 15, I think. Right. And I was like 10 or something. And he'd make like 50 quid a day. This was what, you know, f probably 16, 17 years ago. Right. So that inspired me to like making money online and how to, you know, use my kind of skills in a way. So I've always been quite focused on sales and then I pivoted sort of into SEO mm -hmm. and then I thought, okay, I've got an agency, I can sell as well. So they sort of go hand in hand. Um, and that was when I kind of launched the agency, I think 2013, yeah. maybe 2012. So I think um, where, like, I, I've probably met you like a handful of times. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that stands out to me is obviously you you ran the, or you still do run the SEO agency. Yeah, yeah, um, of and you then realized that instead of just doing it for your clients, let's mm. actually build up some affiliate sites, which yeah. a lot of agency owners want to do. Sure. You ended up selling the affiliate sites, which again, a lot of affiliate site owners want to do. Um, or actually a lot of business owners want to want, want to sell as well. So I think that, that it will probably be insightful picking your brains on that. Mm -hmm. And then from the affiliate sales and stuff like that you obviously did reinvest into other businesses you've mm -hmm. done jvs and stuff like that so i think you've you're 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 one of the few people that have done the full spectrum of things yeah i've done everything um <laughs> what, what what would you say is like being the not not necessarily the, the easiest but like mm. the the less time consuming task if okay. that makes sense in terms of business model yeah i mean agency is great and you know, not to 10 employees is great. Mm -hmm. Once you've got that, that's enough. And then 
leverage that. And then, I mean, I've done SaaS, I've done affiliate, I've done drop shipping, I've done e-commerce, I've done FBA. <laughs> so I've done- <laughs> You've done everything. Done everything. <laughs> the only thing I've not really done, I've done a small amount of content is like YouTube or I've done a little bit, but not to your kind of level. That's the last kind of missing thing that I haven't done to a full, like full commitment. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of business model, I mean, I try and pick um, sort of, there's hard, hard industries I say like, is this a tough, tough industry? And also like trends, I don't jump on trends. So like if- Fidget you know, spinners. Yeah, <laughs> things like that. I hate those niches. Like, so if I'm looking at a business model, whether it's affiliate or mm -hmm. whether it's um, SaaS or whether it's dropship or e-commerce, like the business has to be kind of steady and like not crazy high, not crazy like volatile. Is that because you have the mindset of selling that business in maybe two or three years time or do you just mm. think that because a lot of people would say the opposite to what you're saying yeah, and say well actually no i'm gonna i'm gonna sell fidget spinners for three months yeah i'm gonna make a load of money mm. but then after three months it's just gonna die off yeah i like to take the other side of everything so when everyone's talking about something that's when i kind of swoop into like other older niches where a i don't talk about them really because mm -hmm. i like to keep them close to my chest and then b i just when everyone, t you know, when Clubhouse came out, and yeah, like, wow, like, like check out Clubhouse. I was like, I'll just check it out next year, like if it's still going. You know, I'm not going to discount these platforms or discount these ideas, but I like to uh, give it time. So I do the same with um, with movies. If every, if somebody's like talking about like a, a certain movie or a TV show on Netflix, I'm like, I'll watch it in a year's time. Give it time. Yeah, but with niches specifically, uh, yeah. I don't know. There's so much, especially in the UK, like in the US, I think it's a completely different ball game, but there is so much, from an SEO point of view, there's so much untapped stuff here, mm -hmm. um, whether that be localized stuff or, you know, just like old hat niches that you would never think about. And like things that never changed in time, right? Like law or solicitors, well, um, mortgages, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Those niches, like they're never going to change. You're always going to need a mortgage. You're always going to need solicitors. What, what one really good niche at the minute that's I, I, I like to look at ever growing niches. So like yeah. something that's kinda new, but mm -hmm. you just know it's gonna essentially be something like 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 a mortgage in time. Mm -hmm. Like for example, E V chargers, yeah, solar yeah, panels, yeah. like anything in the green space, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of like government grants and stuff in the UK yeah. that keeps people f like buying them and stuff. But um going back to the agency mm -hmm. life, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously you realize that you you can actually do this yourself um as in like do it like in-house for clients mm -hmm. how did you get your first like let's say five clients uh i was back in the day I, this was like pre pre obviously pre pre covid but this is like 2012 2013 do you remember like bni networking and all those things i don't know if you probably won't know but these are like old school business networking where you you go every thursday you'd have breakfast at like 6 a.m right and like locally in essex and you just turn up and you'd say hi i'm gareth i'm from bulldog <laughs> right <So> okay cringe. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd stand up and you'd talk about it and then you'd have breakfast and then disappear like so you the idea is you have to give a referral to people and you have to be networking mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in air quotes um so just through those kind of things and then i was always quite I'd like to think of myself as quite a good sales guy, but more selling in a way where I sort of know my worth. Like mm -hmm. I knew that I could rank sites. So from an SEO agency standpoint, I mean, you know, there's nine times out of 10 agencies can't even rank a site, yeah. which is ironic. So I knew if I could rank a site, like, and then there was one point when I, I woke up, it was like middle of the night, and you know how you check your rankings? <laughs> I'm pretty bad. But back in the day, I used to check my rankings like if I'd wake up in the middle of the night, like really bad. And I woke up and I was checking. It was literally like 3 a.m. and I checked, I was ranking top for like SEO Essex. Right, okay. And I was like, what the hell? Like, I didn't even know how, like this was when I was just learning SEO. So the agency got to top and then the leads just started to flow from there. So that was kind of the base of mm -hmm. how to drive the agency in the early days, yeah. I've got a question for you and you need to, you need to be a hundred percent honest with this, right? Cause, um, I know a lot of agency owners and they say that the leads that come in from like ranking SEO agency, mm. New York or SEO agency, London, mm. they're absolutely garbage mm. because the type of person that's, that's searching for that, they've kind of might've already been with like two or three different agency owners. They've been burned because there's a lot of cowboys mm. and then they've just got all these crazy KPIs that, that they want you to hit. Mm. Is that the case? Um, 
Yeah, I would say probably yes. The generic SEO terms are too like up the funnel, I would say. Yeah. So if you want to rank for something like technical SEO consultant or something, I'd say that's more down the funnel mm -hmm. and your conversion rate is going to be better. The quality is going to be better. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. I still love SEO, but I think as an SEO agency now, like, again, we're not the best at pushing our agency all the time because we've always got enough work on to cover ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of marketing an agency, it's actually quite tricky, a tricky um, endeavor. So it's like, you can't just have organic, you've got to have everything into it, like LinkedIn retargeting, you've got to have a YouTube, you've got to have... Be a brand. brand. You need a brand, yeah. And like, what is it, four touch points before an yeah. average B2B buyer kind of buys. So you might you might get the odd one coming here and there through the site that are more lead gen, but like, and we're pivoting now more towards like, de I hate all these phrases, but like more demand generation. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, more content and just getting out out there a bit more because we've been definitely bad at that as well so i'd say pushing an agency is actually one of the hardest things and but i would also say like positioning the agency is crucial yeah like we're not trying to do everything we we don't do any like we don't do a lot of strategy it's more just productization so mm -hmm. like links digital pr content right okay. we're quite hands-off so that kind of clientele approach us they know what they're doing so mm, yeah if you want to go for like seo new york and stuff like that or seo london it's a good way to build your base, but I wouldn't focus on it too much. Yeah, definitely. I think um, I, I'm seeing a lot of more agencies now where they're kind of like niching down. So like DTC SEO or yeah. e-commerce SEO or local SEO. And mm. the, the, the thought process is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but mm. internally, once you've got like the base layer of like 10, 15 staff, mm. and let's say you're only doing SEO for lawyers mm. in America, um, kind of like the Ryan Stewart approach. Yeah, sure. He, what he has is he's got like a base layer of links that he knows works, base layer of citations that he knows works. He knows every single service, like um, landing page that he needs to upload to every client site. And with the blog articles, maybe that's like, I don't know, a couple hours worth of research and then that's it. Mm -hmm. I think it, what, once, once you niche down into something like that, it's mm -hmm. a lot easier to scale it out. Yeah, in the in terms of the category, I'd say if you do channel like we pivoted into more e-commerce agency, like what three four years ago, and then obviously e-commerce had the twenty twenty one boom, and then it tailed off, you know, and we then have to pivot again because e-commerce is don't get me wrong, it, on an upward trajectory, but it's nothing what it was in those couple few years. Mm -hmm. So we're pivoting more towards the channel. So like I know Ryan Stewart's more like. SEO for lawyer firms, we're pivoting towards more positioning is just we do these three things. Yeah. So S um, links, content, and digital PR. So I think, again, positioning the agency is always really difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, my friends that have agencies, the most successful ones are always, you know, um, B2B agencies or they, they niche down on the kind of category. But saying that if it goes through like an environment where interest rates are crazy high, you know, the, a lot of new businesses are not being spun out. No, no, new, less new SaaS businesses have got money. Yeah, you're then stuck with an agency that only does something that is in like a decline. So, mm. I think Ryan Stewart's one's quite a good industry because, like, law is law in America is obviously always going to be growing. So, so <laughs> like, so, some of the law firms in America, like, I, I had them on the podcast not too long ago. It's like yeah, some of the some of the um, age or the law firms are spending sixty, seventy grand a month mm. on a billboard, and they're they're not tracking how many calls that's getting. It's no, like no, that's scary. What? Yeah, America. <laughs> I think America's a different beast. Like, yeah, my friend, my friend has an agency in America, and just if you think of the like the total addressable market, like it's just like four or five times the size. And in general, they're just if you meet Americans, their mindset is completely different to the English. Like mm -hmm. they're they're like so optimistic it's crazy whereas in the uk we're more skeptical in, in mindset on everything so yeah. it is tricky i think i think if i was to go back on the agency i would probably try and carve out something more in america like all the businesses that i've had that are most successful all the revenues are coming from the us mm -hmm. so you know i've made majority of my income and in, in air quotes net worth from america mm -hmm. because that's where all the money is so it's like if you're going to start in the UK, then it's not going to be easy. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's um, the 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 
in in the US, like even I'm I'm sure you've you've looked at this before. Uh, you'll load up like what they consider being a small town, but it might be like forty million yes. population, <laughs> right? And like the keyword difficulty is like so low, and you're mm. like, oh my god, I could I could rank this in like an afternoon. Yeah, in theory. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I I could set up a website to rank for this in an afternoon, but then you obviously need to do the link building and stuff. But um. What about retaining clients? Because obviously mm. we've we've spoken about getting new clients, um, yeah. the retention rate. Because that's that's something that I think that a lot of agencies, not even just SEO agencies, but PPC agencies, Facebook ads agencies, they all seem to struggle with retaining. Yeah, I think that comes down to um, wanting to grow in the like unsustainable way. Like, just because you're going to get more clients, that doesn't mean more net revenue, more net profit. Mm -hmm. um, I think as you grow, your margins get squeezed, right? As in an agency world, yeah. The, the the sole fundamental problem with an agency is it doesn't scale in terms of like the flywheel. So the more customers you get, the more inefficient you get, and then the more staff you need, and then you start to be just a HR CEO. Like, yeah, your job is HR rather than actually driving good strategy. So in terms of that, I would say. Um, yeah, agency is sort of like the backwards flywheel. It doesn't scale. Right. So okay. it's like trying to find that balance of how can I retain good clients whilst keeping enough space for the internal team to do my own kind of projects as well. Because mm -hmm. like I feel there's a couple of agency guys that I know and they, they're they all caught up in the agency world and they're, they're doing well, but they're not doing other projects, which that scares me personally. Like... If you look back and 10 years later and all you've done is client work, I mean, clients come and go, right? So it's about using the, that client work and trying to improve their retention. But at the same time, you've got stuff bubbling in the background. So, but going back to your question, how do you improve client retention? It's a tough question. <laughs> I, so like what, one of the recommendations, because I do like a lot of consultancy calls with like agency owners and stuff. Mm. And one of the answers that I always give is that I'll look at their communications with the actual client and it's like, they're getting like the the odd PDF report every single month. Sure. No, and it, it's just like, you're not doing anything for that client to like be sticky. So okay. for example, a few things that you could do, you could even, and, and again, not, not many people like to do this, but they... You you could definitely send out a Loom video explaining well, everything, and, and even even that from like if you think a PDF's down here, mm. a Loom video is like two hundred percent better. Hundred percent. Um, if you can, th there's there's a lot of like for example, um, Ryan, sure he's got like a a community for his um for all of his lawyers, right? Mm. And it's like a lawyer in New York to a lawyer in Boston they're communicating over like how they can help their own retention rate for their clients and yeah, stuff like that so it's like if you can set up stuff like that now again that might not necessarily work for all agencies it works for him because he's only got like law clients mm. and stuff there, there's certain things like that you can go down the education route as well so for example again not many people in SEO like to educate their clients but if, if you can basically educate clients as to why it's super important to get reviews for your Google business profile. Yeah, definitely. That that can also go in your favor. You need to try and think of that, like th how, how can I get this client more sticky? Yeah, and I think that's something we've been definitely not good at is is not cute. Like we get a client on board and then, you know, we'd go through our usual process of Loom and all that, all that mm -hmm. stuff, but they're not looking to us to learn about the industry as well. So yeah. we're not putting out any content, right? really. Yeah. So... They dis we disappear from their lives apart from the monthly kind of catch up, but we don't really do those kind of catch ups. Mm -hmm. It's just more email stuff looms. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like I'm behind the curve on this one. It's putting out more content. Mm -hmm. um, all the best agencies I see outside of the SEO niche are all putting out heap loads of content, um, and they keep front of mind because like if I think of D to C agency, like I've got one guy in my head, and that's not from him doing ads that's from him putting out content mm -hmm. and e i'm on his email list i see his stuff on linkedin all the time and his team as well so it's like keep in front of mind i think is like an understated kind of retention strategy yeah definitely um there's um an another good thing as well um and we've kind of pivoted into this as well is um if you sign up an seo client 
let's say it's for like local, um, you might not want to do this if, if it's like an e-commerce type client, but if it's like, let's say a plumber in Wyoming, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. You can set up a rank and rent website. Mm -hmm. Obviously you as the agency owner owns that website and you just rent that out to them. And again, that's kind of increasing your net profits yep. and also retaining them because then they've got two uh, channels. They've got their own website that's generating them leads via your SEO like mm -hmm. paperwork or your, your SEO um, agency, but you've also got the, like the rank and rent that's kind of running alongside it. Yeah, I think that's also shown. I mean, if if you're the agency owner, I think you can do that with those clients. I think when you've got staff, it's harder to implement those kind of strategies. Mm -hmm. So I've got a site that I, I rent out. It was like six, five years ago, six years ago. You know, it's not doing crazy numbers, but. I haven't spoke to them for like two years and just on a direct debit. Yeah. And you could have more of them. And I know you guys are quite big on that kind of stuff. Um, I think that would be retaining clients. I guess that's in that category of retain retention. But mm -hmm. yeah, low touch points. I think if you can create a product inside an agency that's low touch point, I think when you have all this friction where you onboard the client, you get analytics, search console, you've got to set data studio up, you've got to do all the looms, you've got to do reporting. And then these companies um, have all their people to report to. And then you're doing call after call. And then you've got them on Slack. And it's like, if you have low touch point uh, clients, and also I think it comes down to your like, ICP, what kind of customer do we want to get? Yeah. Because maybe Ryan Stewart's law firms, they're probably, you know, they're busy doing law. They've mm. probably not got big marketing teams, I can imagine, in law space. Um, so they're hiring their agency and that's doing all the work. Mm -hmm. They're not on to like, I need this, I need yeah, that. Yeah. Our rankings have dropped two places. I mean, we just don't deal with that crap anymore. So I think if you can get to that point where you're not serving the client so much in a way where you know your value, mm -hmm. retention will ebb and flow, I feel. But again, going back to retention question originally, I think content is the kind of yeah, way forward, definitely. I think. So looking back at Bulldog, like setting up your agency, What's been the biggest mistake? Oh, God. <laughs> I've had thousands. I've literally had thousands. I mean, I've had thousands of... I've had probably over 100 staff, I'd say, across everything, maybe, over the years. Yeah. I've hired everything. I've tried everything. I've tried cold calling, like, agencies. I've tried um, hiring the best staff that I can get, you know, 70, 80, 90K a year people. I've tried that. I've tried big office... I've tried so many things. So, I mean, I never have called them mistakes because it's sort of like, for me, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. If I find something that I need to get off my chest, I have to express it and I have to invest into it or try it. And then yeah. if it fails, then great. Like, I can tick that off. It doesn't stress me out. But the younger me, I'd say I was more aggressive in terms of, like, taking risk. So now I'm a bit more conservative, I'd say. But... um I mean, I've had so many mistakes. I couldn't give you one. There's so many. I, I've, I think like I, I've been asked this as well. Um, mm. And obviously I've not been doing SEO for anywhere near as long as you have. Like I think mm. I've been doing it for like half the amount. Of, I think I've been doing it for six years. So just a little bit less than half. But um, whenever I get asked the question on like mistakes and stuff like that, I'm like, well, it wasn't really a failure because I learned from it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I tried drop shipping six years ago mm -hmm. and that failed but now i'm like well actually i learned how to do a simple facebook ad setup that's it um yeah. I, 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 I set up a web design agency five six years ago yeah. that failed because i thought that i had to be the person developing the websites coding the websites selling the websites marketing to get the, the actual sales and I, I thought that outsourcing was cheating and i'm like well actually now that i look at it i'm like that was stupid, that was stupid. <laughs> but i love that though. that's what it's all about i mean yeah no one has a perfect career or a perfect track record yeah i mean especially in the seo space it's so low barrier to entry you can just spin up a site mm -hmm. you can change business model overnight so that's the plus point, I'd say. Um, but yeah, I've just had so many mistakes. <laughs> yeah. If you could go back and do one thing differently when setting up your agency, what's what's that one thing that you're like, I wish I'd done it? I think positioning. I yeah. think positioning the agency, I've said it to a few of my friends in the agency world, is the key thing. Is, yeah, positioning 
um, and getting that core team on board. I think not many people talk about that in terms of how to incentivize staff and everyone's looking for that cheap kind of offshore fix. Mm -hmm. I'm quite a big advocate of an in-house team in the UK and then like offshore for the smaller tasks. Um, I mean, my team, the core team that I've got have been with me for, I think, 11, 11 years now. So I've got four four or five that have been with me for like 11 years. So keeping that um, fabric of the agency is key because obviously our clients have dealt, you know, we've had clients that have been with us for six, seven years as well. So keeping this employee base is also really key. Um, what was your question? Was it about mistake? Yeah. Or like what's, different? Yeah. What, what's one thing? Um, I think I'd try and incentivize the staff even earlier. Like lately, I've kind of more incentivized them even more so in the last three years, I think, in terms of the long-term vision. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish I did that a little bit earlier, I'd say, just to keep the incentive, right? I mean, show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. I mean, if you align all this stuff properly, then I think you'll get a better outcome. So I wish I did that a bit earlier. I wish I positioned a bit better earlier. Yeah. Um, and yeah, probably off the top of my head, that's probably it for now. I don't know. Mm. Ever think. What's um, so it, retaining mm. those staff? That's quite a hard thing to do. Yeah, very hard. I what's mean, um, what's what's one thing that you do for like retaining staff? Like, a, a, I I I consider them as like a players. Like, yeah, you you don't want to lose them. Yeah, they are. Um, I'd say me and my brother, because my brother runs out. Our other business it was mainly my, my brother's baby, but I think we're just without being a dick, but we're like kind of nice people to work for. I, from what I've got, the small feedback, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure my stuff will tell me otherwise. But I think we're a bit more laid back. Like me and my brother, are a bit more like it's not the end of the world, less aggressive kind of mindset mm -hmm. in terms of leadership um, and giving them freedom. Like especially post COVID, now it's like much even more so. The staff have got more freedom than ever. Mm -hmm. they can work when they want we're not going to be on their backs all the time. So I think that's crucial is giving them not micromanage. Um, and I think a lot of people are very controlling. Uh, it's like a, a thing that people don't really talk about too much, but a lot of bosses are super controlling. Yeah. Um, and we're like the total opposite. So, you know, it's, it has its pros, it has its cons, but I think a laid back approach um, always helps. And, you know, I've had people that have left working for me before and most of them, from what I know, I've heard, I could be wrong, but most of them haven't had like a, a great boss on the next f few employers. So maybe I'm doing something right, but I'd say being laid back is crucial. Um, and just having quite a fun environment and an experiment, like mm -hmm. the staff, most of them have got side projects. They're doing their own thing as well. So they're learning about SEO, they're learning um, about business as well. Um, they're improving their careers. You know, they're working on my other projects. So they're, they're improving their skill set, which is really important because I hate to be stagnant myself. So if your staff are stagnant, they're going to probably leave as well. Yeah, that's they, like lo looking back to when, when I was employed and stuff like that. I, every time that I upgraded my job, like, like went, went for another job and stuff. That that was the main reason. I, I I felt like I'd hit like a glass ceiling where I'm like, I can't can't really learn anything more. That's um, it. And then I'm like, right, okay, like, but like I I I am um, initially set up as like a web developer. That that's that's what my first office job was. And then I moved into like a an SEO agency. And then I've I've been doing bits and bobs at, since then. And it's like every time I've wanted to level up, I'm like, right, okay, what's next? What's next? What what can I learn here? What what can I learn from the gambling affiliate sites that I've got? Mm. What can I learn from the local rank and rents that I've got? What can I learn from the YouTube side of the stuff? So I'm always trying to level up myself in, in some way. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I think but that's obviously not everyone has that mindset. So it's yeah. like can you pick out the people that do have that mindset and also, you know, not everyone has to have that mindset. Sometimes people do want to be happy work-life balance they mm -hmm. want to turn up to their job and go home which is fine so i think it's like identifying that with the staff um we've done like personality tests with our employees and just trying to understand them a lot better and try and manage them better because everyone is completely different i found but there's also patterns between people as well so i mean it's an ever ever ending problem like hr and managing people is probably the hardest thing to running a business so Again, back to the original like business models, 
try and pick something that requires minimal people management, you know, like affiliate software, something like that, mm -hmm. or rank, rank and rent, which, you know, you set the business up, you set the site up, you rank it, you've got one job. And yeah. Then you find someone to rent it out to. Piece of piss. Yeah, definitely. So then, um, the, the, this is the, the second half of this podcast is going to be a little bit outside of the agency scope, and this sure. is this is what excites me because this is what I mainly know you for. Sure. Um, to like, I think I only realised that you've only got an agency maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah. But before that, I thought like you were the the, the head honcho for affiliate sites. So you've you set up the agency and then you realise, do you know what, there's more to this. Mm -hmm. Let's let's start feeding the actual agency staff into doing some of my running some of your own projects. Mm -hmm. Which I love by the way, because like again, you're not just relying on, on your um on just client work, you've got your own assets and stuff. Hundred percent. But um what what was what was the reason for that? Did, did you think that you're just that good at SEO that you can just do it for your own? No, like, um, no, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I, I've always had multiple ideas in my head that I want to express. <clears throat> and I think the best way to do that is to launch sites and launch ideas. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's because I thought I was really good at SEO. I, I just enjoy it. Like, I enjoy setting up projects and I enjoy the kind of, like, dopamine hit of it, how it works and ranking sites. Like, I love ranking sites. I love the more delayed gratification of ranking sites. So... When it's your own projects, it's even more fun, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'd definitely. say that's the main driver. Yeah, that's good. And then, so from that, you you set up the affiliate sites. Mm -hmm. um, what was the what was the end goal? Like, did you the, think set from word go like mm -hmm. you're going to sell these affiliate sites? Yeah, hundred percent. Right. I mean, like I'm not stupid, but at the same time, like the affiliate industry, <clears throat> I think my first site was maybe 2016, 2015. Uh, I just knew the affiliate industry is always like, you know, it's like, they're not real businesses, I would say, in an essence. They're like, they're just websites that drive traffic and, you know, an arbitrage. So yeah. they're always, and you always see them up for sale. And I was like, oh, okay, like, I guess that's the goal. Like, the goal is to sell these things. Mm -hmm. um, so when we saw the first one, I thought smallish one was like, I think 2017 or something like that. But that was always the goal is like hit a traffic number, hit a revenue and then exit as soon as possible. Because <laughs> <laughs> I just knew, like you'd see, or, and I was watching the kind of funds that were going into it, like private equity started getting interested in affiliate sites because they're very easy to quotes run. Um, so I, when I saw that, that kind of money started flowing into it, like, I took it more seriously. I, I built like a team specifically for sites mm -hmm. and I took the businesses more as a business. So whilst they're not really businesses in my mind, I took it seriously. Like I had a full-time team on, on these projects yeah. with my business partner at the time. Um, so I feel like everyone was taking affiliate kind of like non-seriously. They were just like, yeah, we'll set up a, a site about um, uh, airpurifiers.com or something. And I thought like, let's take it seriously let's build these as like actual brands now we did that to an extent but it was more i mean all the traffic was from seo so mm -hmm. yeah it was treating them as businesses was crucial i think yeah definitely like what one thing that you just mentioned there is you you took it seriously there's a lot of agency owners that i've spoke to over the years and they're like yeah I, w I want to get to 20 clients a month or, or 20 clients paying me every single month and then I'm going to set up an affiliate site. Mm -hmm. And they just think that like <laughs> they don't need like a team. Like they're like, yeah, we can upload 20 articles, mm. do some internal links, do some link building and that's it. Mm. I think the key thing that you've mentioned there is even though it was all SEO traffic that, mm. that you were getting to those is you actually decided to build a team around it. Yeah, and I think this was pre-AI days. So like, yeah. you know... Yeah. there's a caveat to this obviously you need money behind you so like mm -hmm. you need the agency cash flow which i had so i was invest you know one of the sites that that we sold was like two i think we put 250k into it mm -hmm. you know without kind of any reaction like we piled it in we went you know balls to the wall literally we had like 40 writers we had full-time staff on it and like we treated it as a business and you know luckily like the forces kind of worked you know there's a lot of things that could have gone wrong. Like we had everything on our side, like 
the timing was luck, you know. Execution, I wouldn't say was necessarily lucky, but everything else was pure luck, like in terms of exiting, the timing, you know, interest rates were so low, so all this capital was flowing into these, you know, risk assets is what they call them. Um, so I would say that a lot of it was pure luck, but I'd say a majority of it was more building a team and aggressively investing because no one was doing it. People were building these like micro sites, you know, bestmicrophones.com or something. And the market's so small for that one kind of product. So we went big and, and absolutely, you know, crushed it, I guess, to an point and then got out, you know, but it was pure luck. Like a lot of it was pure luck. Yeah. It's not, as I said, that's why I don't, I see it as a success, but I don't love talking about it in a way where it's like, well, we did this amazing thing and it's like, cool, like you might have heard of what it, what happened, but it's like, to me, that doesn't really like, doesn't fulfill me, you know. It was more of a, a phase, I guess. It was mm -hmm. for fun and, you know, for money, I guess, which, but I love ranking sites. So like the dopamine hit of it every day was like, I remember seeing the traffic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you'd wake yeah. like I would be waking up looking at your tra website's traffic, and I'm like, yeah. it's went up twenty thousand yeah, keywords, or of it's went up three hundred <laughs> keywords, or whatever. Yeah, um, and everyone was talking about it, so it's like it was just like it was weird because you'd see YouTube videos about it, and then you'd see it on Twitter, and then and I kind of like went into my hole, like I didn't really want to talk about it too much because it's just like. I don't love the attention of it kind of thing. It was like... Did that ever annoy you? Yeah, I didn't love that kind of... Yeah, to an extent, because I felt like I, it was almost like a cheat. Like, it wasn't really, like, something that, you know... If, if say, for example, if, if that was your agency website that was doing that mm. and it was driving you loads of leads and w would that... And if everybody was talking about your agency site, would would that have felt different to you? Um, I think ranking a site and everyone talking about it doesn't really excite me. I think having mm. a business, you know, I think the biggest, the most thing I'm proud of is the business that me and my brother set up. Yeah. Um, like email octopus. I think I'm really proud of that. And I see, you know, people talking about that a lot on Twitter and stuff. And I'm actually like, this is a proper, it's a, a proper like proper brand surprise. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, a proper yeah. brand. And we're actually like saving, like some of the emails we get, we're saving people so much money on the email marketing you know, churches, charities, all kinds of businesses use us. And like what my brother, mainly my brother, it's a lot of credit to my brother has built there is like, that kind of gives me a lot of motivation. And then with the agency, yeah, I think if it was ranking, nah, I wouldn't really like, I wouldn't really love the kind of attention, mm -hmm. but I wake up every day, like I've got a team and I've got a purpose. The affiliate sites is like the complete opposite of that. Yeah. Yeah, you can have a team, but it's like the least fulfilling kind of enterprise you can enter. Yeah. Because yeah, it's just yeah. like you drive traffic and then people click and then, and then they, they leave. buy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then what? I mean, you can't really There's express just, Yeah. And what I love about the agency, I hate and love it at the same time, but you can always come up with new ideas and new f things. You can come up with new landing pages, new angles, mm -hmm. new channels. Whereas like a affiliate, once you've got an affiliate site, all you can do is more keywords, right? And you might be able to prune some content or update some content. I mean, it's pretty boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. yeah, definitely. I remember um, the first time I spoke to you, um, one of the conversations was, what did you learn about the affiliate side of stuff? And mm. you said the perfect time to sell. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, we both laughed. <laughs> um, and you mentioned earlier, you said that you had a certain traffic score that you were like, right, once we get to that, we're going to sell. Um, was, was there any strategy in terms of selling or is there anything that you look back at now and you're like, I could have strategically sold these sites and I could have been a little bit smarter. Uh, well, luckily, uh, all the sites that, I mean, I think one, one or two sites that got a lot of traffic, we sold at the right time. And there was a couple that got traffic and come and went kind of thing. But in terms of timing, I think that's the, the hardest. It's impossible to know when you're in it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the bubble of 21 when everyone was like, wow, valuations are crazy high. And some of these sites would get like, ridiculous valuations like crazy um and that was peak low interest rates but now we're in a different environment i think getting out of these sites is much harder so yeah. the whole environment's changed and i think sometimes it's good to look back and go all right the affiliate game is kind of in the amazon world is dead really 
the conglomerates are dominating it. And even last week I was searching some terms and it's just like I didn't see any affiliate sites really. So uh, it's tricky because I think timing is a lot of luck. Like mm -hmm. there's no real skill to it. But going into it with the right strategy of like we're going to sell it, like we did know that, but we didn't know when. Um, I think we kind of both knew when we were going to sell it. Like when it was flying, yeah, you just need to know. Like I think it was like two, three, two point five million visitors was a peak a month. So we were just like, we need to kind of get out of this thing now. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it can. Well, I mean, it can come tumbling down fast. And my business partner, luckily at the time, um, at the time, is like more. He's more conservative. Like you know, bird in the hand. His favorite phrase. It's so a bird in the hand is worth more than two in the bush, um, which is actually really good because, you know, it's easy to get your ego in the way and be like, you know, we're going to keep ranking, we're going to keep smashing it. But realistically, with these kind of businesses, you, you're not really. Mm -hmm. They're going to come and go. Do you think that if you didn't have your business partner, mm. do you think you might have uh, probably, pushed a little bit more and yeah, potentially... Maybe, yeah. I know we definitely pushed hard on negotiations as well. Yeah. But maybe i probably would have got ahead of it because i'm a bit more like to be honest like money is like not the main driver of everything i do it's like it mm -hmm. it's nice but but he's quite money orientated to a certain extent which is good because like you know and his main focus was affiliate like i had agency i've got email octopus like i've got other things so for him it's like we need to sell this thing now kind of thing yeah but yeah i probably would have got Bit, I'm a bit more relaxed, maybe too relaxed with these things. <laughs> <laughs> I probably wouldn't have sold at the time, and then yeah, so I was lucky. Yeah, I think again, going, the business partner side of things is good to have sometimes to balance out your kind of. I, I think stuff. so. Like I, I get asked this a lot, like how do you pick your business partners? Because now, um, at a very young age, I've been very lucky to be able to partner up with James, partner up with with Carl, um, and then we've also then bought some some businesses that are like offline and we're helping them bring like more online traffic amazing um and the one of the questions i get asked is like how do you pick your business partners and mm. i don't know what what your thoughts are on this but i always look at my weaknesses and i'm like right okay what's gareth good at right gareth's really good at link building or technical mm. seo right okay i am absolutely shocking at technical seo let's partner up on something obviously mm. then obviously it does come down to the personality if i can go on holiday with you for example i'd be more inclined to <laughs> yeah um to do business with you as well but that that's that's one of the ma the biggest things that i look at um but what what what's some things that you do yeah traits i guess think is i think people go into it emotionally rather than logically so they go in thinking <clears throat> you know, I'll, I'll, I really like this person. And they don't really step back and think like critical thinking and go, all right, what's he good at? What's I'm, what am I good at? And it depends if you're both at different journeys and different stages, you have different incentives. If the other person's got a family, you've not got a family and they're going to be working at different times. Like, I think there's so many things that factor into it. It's hard to know at the time. Mm -hmm. I would just say like, yeah, just make sure you when if you do decide you've got to kind of go with your gut and then write down all your responsibilities and stuff like that but i mean most people know that kind of gen generic advice i think mm -hmm. it's like are you thinking logically when you go into this business relationship or are you thinking with like your emotions i think yeah heart or head and you know i've been quite lucky in the past you know my brother is easy because but again that we've had our issues as well um it's not straightforward like at the time when we launched it it was I think 12 years ago, you know, you're both young and we just, my brother created this product and then I had the agency and I was doing the agency stuff and then he focused on the email octopus and then we had that imbalance, mm -hmm. like I wasn't working on as much as him and then you have these kind of like riffs and fallouts and, you know, luckily obviously I would never fall out with him, but if he's not your brother, you know, you could be in a sticky spot. <laughs> yeah, I've heard so many stories and... Uh, even lately, I've seen another business partnership kind of blow up just through, you know, they go went in with their emotions they thought it was a cool idea. And then, so it's, it's tricky. I mm -hmm. mean, I don't know if there's any formula, personally. Yeah, 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 for sure. So um, Email Octopus, um, obviously, you set up with your brother. Um, and I've actually seen it, I think it was on, is it Capterra? The, yeah, Capterra, yeah. yeah. I've I've seen it on a couple places, but for anybody that's watching, what what is it? What does it do? So the mission is just to 
simplify email marketing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's basically came out the, when we first set it up, I don't know if you've ever seen like Sendy, or this was like early days of where you could hook up Amazon SES, which you can send emails through. Remember, Gareth, I'm like 15 years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How old are you now? 26. Okay, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll change the, uh, the time frames. So Sendy was like an early Amazon SES thing where you spin it up, you can hook it up to Amazon SES, send your emails, blah, 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 for like almost nothing. Right. And when we saw this product, there wasn't a front end to it, so you have to be very technical. Um, so we decided to create a similar kind of vibe, uh, same as like MailChimp, but far, far, far cheaper. Mm -hmm. So like a, such a small scale in terms of price. That was our differentiator. Now it's more simplified. So, you know, Clavio and MailChimp, ConvertKit, all these products now, Beehive, they're, they're going so wide. Um, they're doing everything like um, podcasting and all that stuff. We just do email marketing. That's all we do in a very simplistic way. Um, that's how we captured quite a decent market share. Yeah. Um, but we focus on our product. Like our marketing's okay, but I have our um, product is the focus so all our time and investment goes into the product rather than these big firms have got vc money mm -hmm. they've got targets to hit they've got big shareholders to make their pockets bigger so they end up doing kind of dumb stuff and don't get me wrong a lot of these businesses have done very well yeah but we're more bootstrapped self-funded and we have our customers kind of focus at heart um we know what they want um so we focus on that um, and price yeah. Would you, obviously like the affiliate side of stuff, like multipliers are so low. No, yeah. Nobody wants to buy an affiliate no. or content site at the minute. <laughs> um, things might change, yeah, maybe. hopefully. But um, SaaS, e-commerce, stuff like that, they're still like, the multipliers are high. Yeah. Um, would you ever sell email? Octopus? Yeah, I think maybe one day, yeah. I mean, that's my brother's choice at the end mm -hmm. of the day, really. Um, I think we were thinking about it at one point, I think, Um and then the market kind of changed. Um, but now we're more, um, we sort of understand our kind of mission. We've hired a lot more people now. So we're in a different spot to where we were. It was kind of like a, we're thinking about it, but now it's like we're committed to the stuff we've got um, and it's growing, you know, growing at a decent rate. So SaaS is always going to get a high multiplier, whatever the market. But in today's environment and valuations, I still think, Valuations are quite low in mm -hmm. comparison, but in terms of business models and the broader market, like the public markets, that's kind of, SaaS has still got quite a high multiple, so it does feed down. Yeah. Um, this is why it confused me. Like when you look at the affiliate sites and stuff, there's no content sites in, you know, in the public markets. So it's like, how are these sites getting such crazy multiples? They're clearly poor businesses because there's no no business at the public doing this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, I, I never understood it, but I was always going to enjoy the wave of affiliate. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I, th I think as soon as you see that that wave and you're like, well, I, I, need, I need to jump on this. Need to jump on it. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky because obviously I, I'm quite an advocate of not jumping on waves, but I saw affiliate as just like it's fairly easy. Yeah. Um, and it was fun. I loved ranking sites. It's like, why not? Mm -hmm. But look, if I were to do a site now, like I would never do affiliate now. It's mm -hmm. just I, I think for, from what, what you've been saying, I, I think you would probably want to attach it to an actual business. Yeah, where it's 100%. like maybe you buy a law firm mm -hmm. um, or you invest into a law firm and they don't have the best SEO and you're like, right, okay, don't worry. I can I can rank you number one for lawyers in London in 12 months time. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that, that that's that's certainly what we're looking at anyway that's the um, arbitrage I think also like you can buy a lot of businesses now that people are retiring or sites that have got amazing links mm -hmm. and you can just go in and spruce up the site um, and you're going to be far better off than the people running these businesses so I think yeah. there's a lot of arbitrage there especially in the UK yeah yeah definitely um, there, there's like there's there's accountancy firms and the owners are like going um retiring and they, they've already got like a book of 500 clients you could buy some of these for like lower than like a million pounds let's say so some of them um yeah. and just by doing some seo or even if you've got like a team for ppc you can run some of that and very quickly that five hundred thousand pound or what that one million pound asset is now worth triple that yeah overnight yeah yeah i think that's the arbitrage i think buying uh, i bought business um three years ago and the whole thing didn't work out but 
you know, I got it pretty low price. I got an amazing domain. I got everything. I got all their processes. Um, but then COVID happened and kind of fucked the business. And also the business model wasn't as good as I thought. Mm -hmm. um, but I bought off this like um, retired couple and like they were super nice. And the whole thing went really well in terms of the relationship and the earn out and everything. But the business didn't work. So, yeah. you know, that could have been the other way. It could have been the other side. But I think I would probably do that again um, by another business potentially. But I don't know. I kind of like starting from scratch now. I've come to think of <laughs> it's nice. See, I, I'm the, I'm the opposite where I'd rather invest in a business mm. as opposed to buy it because if say for example if I buy like an account or if I invest in an accountancy firm mm. and that chart accountant still stays on, I know that they're really good at their job mm. and I can just do the marketing for them. I I prefer that as opposed to starting from new because I think starting from new is like completely new industry mm. you need to understand all the regulations all the laws yeah um yeah i quite like that though i think these high barrier to entry um niches like regulation and stuff like i'm quite a big advocate of that where industries have high regulation mm -hmm. one of the industries that i did buy had higher regulation so when i bought it, it was actually it, you're right it was beneficial to have that kind of um reassurance mm -hmm. they've been through the process but yeah, I think if I was to set up again a new industry or a new niche, I do like the high barrier to entry stuff because it, it does wean out a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I was definitely. looking at niche yesterday and it was, what was it? It was like car insurance or car insurance for Americans living in the UK. And it's like, I think a lot of them struggled to get car insurance over here. I'm only had a quick look, but I just love those kind of niches that no one's really thinking about or talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they had like 30,000 Trustpilot reviews or something crazy. And I was like, "This is this a niche? Like, I love those niches where no one's really seeing them and thinking about them, mm -hmm. trying to carve out a kind of business there that's, or a site even. Yeah, definitely. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about your mindset because sure. a lot of people after selling their affiliate sites and stuff or mm. um, having the success that you've had over the years they would be like right i'm i'm, I'm happy no, I'm, <laughs> I'm done i don't i don't want to deal with any more clients i don't want to deal with any more yeah. SaaS products or investing into new businesses they'd be chilling on a beach in bali yeah living the, li living the life right but what's um what keeps you ticking like yeah i think learning is the thing i love like i pretty much as i said i've tried literally everything um all the all the business models i could um, I'm sure there's still loads out there, but in terms of front of mind ones that I've tried, um, I love trying new business models. I love um, working with my team. Like I love doing new projects with them. I love seeing them excited and giving me ideas. That's what keeps me motivated. I think if I didn't have a team mm -hmm. and I was just an affiliate guy that launched sites, I'd be pretty depressed. You really don't like affiliates, no, do I don't you? Like affiliate. It's <laughs> tough. I'm, I'm talking Amazon affiliate. Like, yeah. I'm sure there's other, there's, there's tons of other different niches outside of Amazon. But I'd say in terms of mindset, yeah, keeping that purpose and the team keeps me going. I'd say mm -hmm. without a team, I'd really struggle. I think. Yeah. Um, what's um, what's been the biggest dopamine hit for you, oh, where you've been like, oh, oh I love this. Yeah. So one that stands out. Mm, I think, I think seeing a site go from like zero, like in terms of on the rankings, like zero to like almost one. I think even the biggest dopamine here. Oh, it's a tricky question. I think it's still ranking. I love like seeing the green arrows. I love Ahrefs. Although I'm spending less time on it now, or Ahrefs, however you call it. I'm spending less time on it now. Is that because of the credit system? Yeah, the credit system. <laughs> I think they're changing it, but yeah, the credit system. Yeah, no, I, I was at times where I was obsessed with it, but I like, when I'm obsessed about something, I think that's when I get all the learnings. Like the stock market is like, for me, it's not trading, but learning about it. Like mm -hmm. I probably listen to 20 hours a week of like commentary on the stock market. Right. And like podcasts on the stock market or CNBC I watch all the time. It's like an American network. I'm a bit weird. <laughs> Pro proper like old man style yeah, that. Yeah, old style. But then I watch all the podcasts off of that, like um, acquired podcasts, really good, breaking down new business models. And I, I love content. I love YouTube. I'd say that's like 
for me, my hub of where I spend a lot of my time is just listening to podcasts, interviews, or I like to follow like the big CEOs, like, <clears throat> you know, the JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, all the big like bank guys, Warren Buffett. I love, I love just their mindset because, you know, when you mentioned about Hormozy and stuff like that, like I try and stay away from the internet marketing guys because I feel like there's always an incentive for them to sell you something or you're somewhere in their funnel. Um, I don't love those kind of guys. I love the like actual, the top dogs that aren't producing content all the time. Yeah. Personally, that's where I spend a lot of my time. But I get a lot of dopamine hit from that, I'd say. Right, sure. okay. What's um, like, <clears throat> I was speaking to Gary Wilson mm. start of the year. And he was saying that he's got aspirations to become a billionaire. He's he's already sold his link building agency. He's done very well. Mm. He's got a successful letting agency now. Nice. And um, he says, yeah, my, my aspirations is I want to become a billionaire. Mm. What's um, what what's what's your end goal here? Well, I was never really motivated by money. I think that's been really helpful. Yeah. Because like the more the people that I've seen that made a lot of money, kind of they lose a bit of purpose sometimes. Um. Mm. So for me, it was always just about what's that next thing? Waking up, coming up with an idea. I've never asked like aspirations to be a millionaire, billionaire. That was never my mindset. Um, so I think that's really helped me. Um, just not having that money hungry kind of motivations. And I think money is like, it just makes you more content. It doesn't really like fulfill you. Have me, you right. have, have you always been like that? Or would you, would you say? Yeah, I'd say so, yeah. Right, okay. I, I try, I think so. I'd like to think money's not changed me really. Right. I'd say it just it gives me access to a few more things. You know, I could do certain things, but I've still, I'm still hanging out with kind of the similar people. You know, I'd say business is more where I love. Like it's opened up many doors to friends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like money hasn't really. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Maybe my small success has opened up a few more doors, but and that's success is like material from money. The thing is business is like is money at the end of the day. So it's like it it's a scoreboard. It is a necessity. So you have to be profitable to keep the lights on. So it is kind of a scoreboard and it's good to like think about it sometimes. Otherwise you sort of get wrapped up in the why am I doing this business model? Were were, were you um, were you ever a gamer growing up? No. no I think that one thing I think's really helped me is I was never like into gaming. Right. I was okay. never into football like and the people that you know there's nothing wrong with being into these things but i think they're a huge distraction for me back in the day like, i just loved business really in right. a weird way and cricket <laughs> even weirder <laughs> cricket <laughs> yeah <I know. laughs> but i don't love cricket as much anymore it's now golf um, right but i've always been quite obsessed with things that less people are obsessed about because like Everyone talks about football all the time in the UK. Like, yeah. Oh, and the season just started now. Fun. <laughs> so I, I try and stay away from like the mainstream stuff. I sound like a dick now because I probably do. I do go into mainstream sometimes, but. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. What, um, what, what's, what are some like short term goals? Um, what, ones that you're obviously. Short term want goals. To, want to um, share. I mean, I'm working on my FBA product at the minute. So that's been really exciting. Um, I launched one in America that failed. The UK one's doing quite well. So that's the kind of goal really is just keep keep growing that. Um, I really enjoy it. Um, and I like the kind of nature of it. It's repeatable. It's a consumable. Um, so that's been that's been really kind of in my mind successful. It, the monetary value is not huge, but mm -hmm. I think it's got a lot of potential. Um, that's my short term goal at the minute. And then repositioning the agency again probably for the 10th time <laughs> so, is, it, is that is that more of a long-term goal or yeah agency world is always like ever-changing it's quite cyclical so the economy goes back a bit have to keep repositioning there's always a lot of short-term goals with the agency just trying to improve it efficiency improve gross profit increase, mar increase margin um keep the staff happy i guess i've always got those generic short-term goals like keeping the team happy stuff like that but with at the minute i'm working mainly on the fba product um and just usual kind of fitness goals i guess nothing crazy what, what, what are some fitness goals um well just keep going to the gym but again right. I'm, I'm not really like a goal more oriented mindset because it's like once you get to that goal like no what makes you feel horrific mm. so it's like 
for me, I'm just trying to build these kind of. I'm not into like ice baths all that stuff. Like I just <laughs> keep it very simple. <laughs> like again, that's another trend. You know, there's a lot of people that made a lot of money. I was just about to that. say that. Yeah, part I can I already feel it is declining already, and like you're stuck in selling these huge ice baths. So you got to ship. Absolute pain in the ass business model, but can make a lot of money from it. But in ten years' time, are people going to be wanting to do these ice baths? I mean, the science already changed on it. It's like not even that beneficial for like muscle growth and stuff like that. So it's like, why are we doing these things? Yeah, I, th I think I think the three biggest people or the three biggest things that people have learned from this podcast is don't do affiliate. <laughs> <laughs> avoid it or sorry don't do amazon affiliate yeah don't do amazon affiliate. um don't do trends yeah and try to do a business or try to set up a website that's attached to the business i think i think those are three big mm. deciding factors yeah and build it build a good team i think yeah it's generic advice but try and incentivize the team where you're not you know taking all the money out yourself personally i think it's also mm -hmm. crucial yeah definitely so where, where can people find you uh, i'm posting a little bit on linkedin at the minute so just gareth ball b-u-l-l -L, on linkedin um that's it for now so yeah you can see i'll um there. i'll uh, yeah. I'll, I'll have a link down, down down in the description so you guys can check him out but thanks so much for joining no me. problem thank cheers. you cheers